Sup Freaks, it's your boy Marty here to introduce this episode of Rabbit Hole Recap. Matt and I just had a really good rip. You'll learn all about it when you listen to this episode. This episode, while we're on the subject of it, was brought to you by our good friends at Unchained Capital. You freaks already know all about them. Uh, They're helping provide Bitcoiners with financial services, cater to Bitcoiners. They do this uh, with a security first mindset. And so their security product is their vault product, which allows you to engage in a two or three multi-sig quorum with Unchained, where you can use a treasure, a ledger, soon to be cold card. Uh, and you hold two keys. Unchained holds one. You can always move your Bitcoin out of the multi-sig wallet when you want to. If you are in a pinch and you need Unchained to sign that second key in that two or three quorum, they're there for you. On top of this, they have their collateralized loan programs. If you don't want to sell your Bitcoin, you can use Bitcoin as collateral to get US US dollar liquidity, same day US dollar liquidity at that sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, where, where was I? Yeah, collateralized loans. Unchained offers collateralized loans. You put your Bitcoin up, you get US dollars as long as you're paying that loan back and um, keeping your collateral at a certain level, depending on where the price is, you do not have to sell your Bitcoin. Uh, on top of that, they've got a bunch of open source uh, projects it's working on, including Caravan, which is an open source uh, uh, software that is their multi-sig vault set up. So if you don't want Unchained involved at all, you can download Caravan and do it all yourself. And they recently re- released version two of Caravan with a bunch of cool new features, including being able to dump an XPUB key in coin selection, uh, hardware testing suite, hardware wallet testing suite, and a bunch of other cool stuff on top of that. Working on Slip39 Hermit, uh, and they've got an incredible blog series, Parker Lewis, Will Cole, Drew Bonsall, Joe Kelly, Phil Geiger, writing incredible content about Bitcoin, why it's important, and everything that Unchained is doing. If you want to go see what Unchained is doing, go to www.unchained-capital.com. That's www.unchained-capital.com. Dot com. Next up, we had our good friends at the Cash App. They're helping you do many things. You can stack sats, sell sats, send sats, receive sats, DCA into sats. Sats are the standard on the Cash App. Uh, on top of that, uh, they are allowing you to stack slivers of stonks if you want to. Hit a bingo board mark there. Uh, if you're, you have a favorite stock is a little too expensive. You don't want to buy a whole stock you can buy as little as $1. And because it's all connected to your bank account or cash app is your bank account. Did you know that the cash app could be your bank account? They're providing you with account number and routing numbers. Uh, so you can start direct depositing your paychecks into the cash app and get access to stat sacking, uh, stonk sliver stacking, uh, and their boost program. Cash app investing is a subsidiary square. Remember SIPC. Uh, and because I didn't even get to the, the ringer there because it's directly connected to your bank bank account or it is your bank account. You have to wait four to five days, start stacking sats immediately, start stacking slivers of stonks immediately. If you want to, if you don't want to, you can ignore the stonks. Okay. Some people like them, a sat stackers. We focus on the sats, but the optionality is there. Uh, as always, when you download the cash app, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's one word S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get $10, and $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. <laughs> Download the Cash App today and enjoy this rip. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. What is up, freaks? It's your boy, Marty Bent, here for this week's edition of Rabbit Hole Recap, sitting down with Matt O'Dell, and the tables have been turned. He's taking a break from drinking. I'm drinking some ciders. What's up? It's a little bit early. It's a little bit early for alcohol right now, so I'm drinking some uh, nitro cold brew instead. Yeah, the island vibes are high right now. Uh, it felt, felt like it was 
a good time for a cider, especially considering all the content we have to talk about. A lot of uh, stressful subjects during a stressful time throughout the world. Uh, but before we get into any of that, as we always do, let's scroll over to Clark Moody's Bitcoin dashboard. Check the price. Ooh, it's higher than I realized. It's at $9,790 right now. Just ticked up to 7,993. Looks like it seems to be going up. We're at block 633,050. We had a downward difficulty adjustment this morning. It was, uh, I believe, the eighth largest difficulty adjustment to date in the history of Bitcoin. It was around 10%. Um, Tiny. Tiny. It was uh, when we first, what was it, last week or the week before? They were predicting like negative 18%, so it seems like more hash rate has joined the network. Too bad we couldn't uh, bet then, on it. Uh, you could have on FTX. Uh, maybe not U.S. users. Yeah. Um, the uh, What else is going on here? Next three targets scheduled for about June 19th. Right now it's looking at still negative downward adjustment of about 5%. We'll see if that changes especially as the rainy season in China starts to pick up. Um, maybe that's that's something we don't have the list. Maybe we should touch on is Leo Zhang's piece. Um, where are we at? Mempool transactions at 16,600. The percentage of fees versus the reward for the next block are about 10.65% uh, on average. Where am I looking here? For the last 2016 blocks, it's been around 11%. So fees are going up uh, a bit here. Uh, miners are getting more more sats via fees. And anything else you want to point out on this dashboard? Do you have it up, Matt? I do not have it up. What is uh, the Whirlpool stats at? Whirlpool stats are currently... Unspent capacity is 1,112.5 Bitcoin. Unspent value is about $10.9 million. Unspent count is 17,423 UTXOs. So the TX0 volume in the last 30 days has been 583.92 Bitcoin. Awesome. And this, yeah. So there's been 6,446 cycles in the last 30 days as well. So people are, people are whirlpooling. They're pulling their, their stuff together. Are we going to hit all-time highs? We hit all-time high in May, right? Yeah, we broke. May May hit a new all-time high, so that's three in a row now. Yeah, let's go. Three months in a let's row. Keep it, let's keep it going. Um, we got we got a tight stop today, so we, we got a lot to talk about. Such a huge fucking uh, list. Such a huge list. Lots to talk about. First up. Pretty confusing situation. I'm still trying to digest it myself. Trezor released a firmware update yesterday, and they disclosed a bug having to do um, with BIP 143, I believe. 143? Yeah, and partially uh, signed Bitcoin transactions. Yes. Um, so they announced that. they Apparently, they've known from 90 Days. Uh, Salim, who is the hardware uh, wallet hacker extraordinaire is I think the one who identified it. But the weird thing about this situation is that it seems like Salim and Trezor sort of sat on this vulnerability. It didn't make other hardware wallet providers, um, sort of aware. They of told it. Ledger uh, and shift crypto. Uh, they didn't tell anyone else. And this also affects software wallet makers, uh, Wasabi wallet, Electrum, BTC pay, all affected core hwi uh integration is affected and they all found out about it yesterday with the blog post so there's a lot of confusion right now uh this is obviously not an ideal situation it does kind of feel like a publicity play which pisses me off uh the severity of this attack is not questionable right yeah you have to be a minor yeah, you have to be a miner to actually take the Bitcoin. It involves a replay attack on the transaction that you are signing, where the first time you try, it pops up some kind of generic error message, and then it changes it so the fee gets increased with whatever UTXOs you have had selected for the transaction. And then if you don't pay attention to that, 
to, to verify at that point, um, you end up signing a transaction that has a really high fee. So to actually take the money, you'd have to be a miner as well. But there's a situation where it could be used for griefing or, you know, just screwing people over by making them lose their money. Uh, or ransom where you say, if you don't pay me, I will broadcast this transaction and make you lose money. Uh, so all these teams right now are, are working to see how severe the issue is. Uh, and if you know how, how they, how they want to approach to fix it, cold card released a preliminary response, which we've linked to. Uh, in the show notes, uh, BTC Pay says if you upgrade your Trezor, then you can no longer use BTC Pay's integrated wallet functionality with your Trezor. Um, so they're telling people not to upgrade right now. Uh, Cold Card is still in their preliminary investigation since they just found out about it yesterday. They don't want to say anything completely concrete, but I've been talking to them. And if you use, they're pretty sure using the micro SD card for your, for shuttling your, your partially signed Bitcoin transactions mitigates this attack, uh, pretty well because you, you know, you have to re-sign the second change transaction. So like if you're moving it back and forth, uh, there's like an extra step in there that something is wrong. Um, and you, you know, you always want to verify what the details say on the actual device as well. You know, it requires the user to, 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 to sign a, a wrong transaction. Um, best practice in general with cold card, and they, it's important to reiterate it here, is when the computer that you create the transaction on and the computer you broadcast the transaction on, let's say you build the transaction uh, in Wasabi and you move it to your cold card to sign it. If you use a different computer to broadcast it, that should help mitigate this. Um, yeah. Rodolfo literally just tweeted a minute ago. Uh, here's what he said. In my honest opinion, it's very hard to pull this off using cold card plus micro SD air gapped infected system builds PSBT. And then it goes to micro SD and then to cold card. Cold card signs it, then broadcasts with a different software computer. Uh, malware needs to combine the two PSB T's it got you to sign, then broadcast merged version. Um, S- the S- micro SD card also makes malware not able to replay. Yeah, I have literally been talking to Rodolfo about this for like the last two hours, <laughs> trying to get to grips with it before we started recording. Uh, so it is good to see that he released something publicly. Uh, you know, we will know more over the next, next week before RHR comes out again. Um, this is just really, you know, it just, it's every, all of this feels very childish. Like how is core not notified? Um, it, you know, that they say it's, it was for responsible disclosure reasons, but that's bullshit. They've been sitting on this for 90 days. Uh, and they release it as a blog post. So I, uh, it is it is very troubling. The attack seems doable, but not sure exactly how bad the severity is. I know Andrew Chow is really pissed off uh, as well uh, because it it does break HWI. Um, the Trezor people keep saying just use Trezor Connect. Uh, which is their their centralized, trusted third-party option. Uh, and they've never really liked PSBT to begin with. So this does kind of feel um, like there's, there's outside motives there. Um, but I don't want to, you know, like a lot of this is very much over my head and people are trying to figure out exactly what's going on. So I don't want to say anything too concrete here. But in general, you know, maybe if... If you don't need to make a transaction right now, then, you know, maybe just wait a little bit before you, because well, P- as long as PSPT particularly, right? I, I mean, it affects Trezor and Trezor doesn't, uh, Trezor doesn't support PSPTs. It's a BIP 143 vulnerability. And, 
in SegWit output. So if 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 you don't need to send a transaction on your hardware wallet right now, it might just be best to just wait a little bit for the dust to settle because as long as your device is offline and not signing any transactions, then you can't lose any money no matter what, right? So just as in, in an abundance of caution, uh, it's best to just wait, the, wait for the dust to settle. Like we'll know a lot more in the next 12, 24 hours because all these smart people are fucking scrambling right now because of the way this disclosure was handled. Um, I like, you know, BTC Pay is telling you not to update your treasure. So um, it is definitely a very delicate situation and I, I wish it could have been handled better. Yes, I would, as an outside observer, label this as an irresponsible disclosure. I mean, just drop this and expect everybody to react to it, especially on the day that Core version 0.20.0 is released and there's new HWI Which uh, they merges. Broke. Yeah. Uh, and this is and- it's bullshit because Trezor knew, the Trezor team knew that this affects the software wallet side. Because at the same time that they released their blog, they released pull requests on a bunch of the different software libraries. So they were, they were well aware, and instead they chose to keep it to, the, to themselves. And it's, uh, you know, and then at the same time, they're like, you know, we don't care as much about integrations as we do about securing our users' Bitcoin. Well, if that's the case, then why the fuck are you still selling the Trezor One, which is a completely unsafe hardware wallet? that you can't even enter a passphrase on the device and Trezor themselves say you can't securely use the, the device without a passphrase. Fucking ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous and hopefully we'll have more to talk about it next week. And we do have a really big, big list. So we wanted to front load this disclosure here, um, but I don't think we have much more to say besides that, right? No, I, I mean, I'm just... A little surprised that Trezor would act this uh, this sort of blasé in this blasé fashion. Um, yeah, it's pretty shitty timing again with version zero point twenty point zero coming out and HWI stuff is something that I've been very excited about. I read about it today in the bent, and to see them sort of fuck with that is is a little disheartening. But hey, maybe who knows? Maybe the vulnerability is such that HWI, as it is. Um, certainly or presently designed may not be compatible with this bit 143 um bug so if you look on twitter right now like in the last half an hour andrew chow is fucking pissed he is so fucking pissed and if that kid's pissed like you know something's wrong you know he's such a calm such a calm smart kid and if he's but he's looked he seems furious right so so there's there's a lot wrong here with how this all went down and, and we should have a lot more to talk about it. But on this topic of hardware wallets, Shift Crypto, who's notoriously been attacking Cold Card um, and CoinKite for the last four months, five months, released a blog post yesterday or the day before that they are pivoting their business to get rid of the node, the, their node project, the Bitbox base that they've been working on all this time. They're not going to do that anymore. And they say they're just going to focus on their hardware wallet um the bitbox but at the same time they're being liquidated there's a liquidation report on on the swiss government website that their company is going out of business and their blog has not mentioned it at all and mr hoddle brought it up on twitter and they complete radio silence they're not they're not responding to him on twitter this was i think two days ago and there's still no response there Meanwhile, if you go to their website, it says that the hardware wallet's not currently in stock on their website, but the they redirect you to resellers who are still selling it. So I want to know what the fuck is going on there, and it is completely unethical to be selling a hardware wallet that you know you're not going to be able to support just because you're trying to clean out inventory because they're getting liquidated. Yeah, that's fucking drama in the hardware wallet oh space my God. Uh, that is uh another very disheartening thing to see like just offloading inventory to make your bankruptcy proceedings uh less painful and how long did they know move. this like how long 
How long have have they known that that they were going out of business and they still kept selling hardware wallets? Uh, well, didn't we know? Did it? Didn't we find out that they were like stopping the production of their hardware wallets at one point? Shouldn't that have been a sign that they like stopped? There were a lot like of recently in the last like three months or something like that. There were a lot of rumors, you know, and we were careful about what we reported and what we didn't because they were unconfirmed. But now we have confirmation that they are being, in fact, liquidated. So I want to say, what the fuck? What the fuck is going on there? And, and let's get some transparency. Let's, you know, I, I don't. Th- no one should be buying these hardware wallets if the company is going out of business. It is, uh, it is just irresponsible and unethical. Yeah, and these hardware wallets should be as open source as possible. That's why I like Cold Card. I'm very excited to see what Zach uh, Herbert and crew um, have to produce this summer. Apparently, they they should have something hitting the market at some point this year. Um, but, so hopefully, I mean to be clear here, like you can use the Bitbox with Electrum. Uh, even if they go out of business, but the issue comes down to firmware updates and whatnot with that, right? Like who's going to, who's going to actually update the firmware? Are they going to continue supporting it? Are they going to do it unpaid when the company goes out of business? That is all right, I guess, you know, it's not ideal, but if that's the case, let's get some disclosures. Let's get some transparency. Let's know what the fuck's going on. People are using your hardware. They're trusting your hardware. What the fuck is going on there? Yeah. So you freaks, I would look into Foundation Devices, which is uh, the company that Zach Herbert uh, is a part of. I believe he started it, um, and they're they're based in Boston, and they're building the Open Hardware Foundation for Bitcoin and the decentralized internet. I think they're going to come out of the gate with a very different uh, posture than some of the other hardware uh, providers out there at the moment. So if what? you want to support some something, doing it correctly. Uh, I, would, I would look into foundation and, and support them. I mean, I am also very excited about their project. Uh, they, they, have self, they have self said that they want to be the cold card of America because uh, cold card is in, in Canada. So we'll see what they have. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful for that. Did you just say decentralized internet? What the hell is that about? I don't know. Is Bitcoin a decentralized internet? I don't know. You're just reading their marketing speak on their website or whatever? I was just reading their Twitter, their Twitter uh, uh, bio. Well, I, I don't, you know, buzzwords. We'll get Zach on to to explain himself. No, yeah, I like I like Zach, and I'm excited to see what he has because, especially in in a world where we want to be able to easily use multisig across vendors, uh, we're going to need more than a, a handful of of good hardware wallets to use with, right? So, uh, there's plenty of room for multiple players here. So, we, I, I'm I'm excited to see what they have in store for us. Yes, um, we shall see. The hardware flame wars never end. There's flame wars, and, and you can point to one vertical within Bitcoin, one little niche area of Bitcoin, and there's probably a flame war going on. Um, on to more positive updates, but there's going to be some negative sprinkled into this now because of the uh, the revelations of the last couple of days on the hardware wallet side. Bitcoin Core version 0.20.0 was released yesterday, as I mentioned before. And like I said, I wrote about it in the bent today because it includes a lot of uh, really important things that uh, I've personally been anticipating and writing about for over a year now. Uh, So the big three updates that I highlighted in the bent today uh, were, number one, uh, it um, merged a change that is going to uh, make the selection of peers in the network uh, different and make it so you're not choosing peers from uh, one ISP provider. Uh, This is to help mitigate potential Erebus attacks, which we've talked about here before. An Erebus attack is when uh, you have a bunch of nodes that are running uh, using the same internet service provider, and that internet service provider may have the potential to realize that these Bitcoin nodes are using it and they could uh, enact a partition attack and start feeding those nodes bad data. Um, so get peer info RPC now includes a mapped underscore AS field to indicate the mapped autonomous system used for diversifying peer selection. So C dash AS map configuration option described below in 
underscore new settings underscore. So that's pretty big. Makes the network more robust against these Erebus attacks, which I believe Gleb Naumenko was one of the first, and Peter Willow were two of the first people to sort of identify this attack and bring it to light in August of last year. It's basically an eclipse attack at the at the ISP level, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so that's that's incredible to see. Uh, there's a new RPC, a bunch of new RPCs, but one in particular, Dump TX Outset, uh, is an RPC outputs a serialized snapshot of the current UTXO set as script is provided in the contrib-dev tools directory for generating a snapshot of the UTXO set at a particular block height. Uh, why is this important? This is important because it is the first step in... Uh, enabling Assume UTXO, which is James O'Burn's little pet project, and he uh, created Assume UTXO in the hopes that it would help individual users uh, get through IBD quicker. So anybody who wants to use Bitcoin Core and actually validate uh, the transactions they're receiving uh, qu- rather quickly, they want to download Core and actually use it in a timely manner, Assume UTXO will let them uh, download the little speed up the initial block download time significantly uh, using quasi checkpoints, um, but they'll be signed by many people and verified by many people. And at the same time, uh, you'll do IDBV, assume UTXO, uh, using some assumptions in there, but the full state, the full chain state will be verified in the background as you're running that as well. So you will eventually, with U- assume UTXO, have a fully verified chain state so in the beginning uh, it requires trust and then while that trust is minimized to a degree and then over time you will then end up fully validating yes after the checkpoint that exists besides assume utxo that i think the last checkpoint was like 2013 or something like that exactly i think this dump utxo set uh starts at block 16,899. so pretty pretty early on in bitcoin's life i guess it's just it's getting their toes toes a little dirt, a little wet and then lastly what i highlighted and we'll talk about a couple other things but this is just what i highlighted was um for watch only while it's creating a new transaction in the send screen or fee bumping an existing transaction the transaction screen will automatically copy a partially signed bitcoin transaction or a psbt to the system clipboard this can then be pasted to an external program such as HWI for signing future versions of Bitcoin Core should support a GUI option for finalizing broadcasting PSBTs, but for now, the debug console may be used with the finalized PSBT and send raw transaction RPCs. Or you can um, use Blockstream's transaction broadcaster through your through any web browser. Yes, and let me make a correction on the Assume UTXO thing. It's not Block 16,899. I think that's the number... Uh, of the RPC that they uh, they referenced at the end of that that sort of exp- explanation. So I don't know what block uh, um, that's going to happen at. Uh, but back to the the update with HWI. This is big because to date you've had to do everything in the command line with this, and this is a step towards moving these PSBT processes to the GUI, the graphical user user interface, so you can do it. Uh, much easier if you're not technically competent. Uh, note that uh, right now with this update, you can only uh, you can only create a transaction in the GUI. Uh, you have to sign and broadcast it uh, either on the hardware wallet or in the command line of Core. So it's not well, you doesn't s- get everything. The idea, well, first of all, HWI is hardware wallet interface. It's how it's the protocol that that Core or other software interacts with your hardware wallet. Um, the idea is basically your, your, your software wallet is constructing, the, knows, knows your UTXOs, is constructing your transaction. And then you're signing it on the hardware wallet, and then you're broadcasting it. And it's three different steps. And one thing to keep in mind here is, is the computer that you're, that you're, constructing the psbt on if it it, there's an element of trust there you got that psbt can be changed or something by a malicious party that's why it's always 
really important to verify it on the actual device when you're when you're doing the signing and and make sure that the outputs are where they're you know they're going to the addresses and with the right amounts that they're supposed to be going to. Yes, so be aware of that. On top of this, these three uh, updates, which I highlight highlight other sort of big changes in version 0.20.0, the removal of BIP61 reject messages. Uh, these were messages that would sort of be sent to your node to tell you why a transaction was rejected. Uh, core developers think it's sort of unnecessary, so they removed it. Um, and then the removal of BIP70 payment protocol. Fuck yes. Uh, and open SSL. So this was a, a payment protocol that was added uh, in the hopes of making easily readable addresses, and it leveraged open SSL. Many wall providers, most almost every wall provider, didn't implement this for many reasons, mainly because open SSL has its own security flaws. Uh, so m- most people have been using uh, BIP21 payment protocol uh, to integrate in their wallets with clickable links, scannable QR codes. Um, and in other features and so nobody's using bip 70 so they really they removed that code from from the code base which seems like a a beneficial uh an overall benefit for the network the famous one was bitpay had bip 70 required so you could it, it made paying bitpay invoices like almost impossible for the average user uh yeah. fuck bitpay use btc fuck. pay server <laughs> Fuck bit pays right. So yeah, core version twenty zero point twenty point zero is out. Let's go back to Clark's dashboard and see if does he have? Oh, he doesn't have version twenty point zero on here yet. Um, I believe I saw something like two hundred people had downloaded it at one point towards the end of the day yesterday. I'd expect that number's a bit higher at this point of us recording. Um, but if you want to go test it out, test out these features if you're um, running a full node and, and using core a lot and you want to test this stuff out, it's available for you to download. We will put a link to those release notes and the software in the show notes. Whew. Holy shit. This is a fucking loaded ass list. Let's just jump to just a really happy one. Uh, our boy, Will Cole, who we recorded with last week, uh, that episode should drop shortly, I imagine. Marty's in Monday. charge of that. There you go. Um, he didn't tell us when we recorded, uh, so we were surprised as well. His mother-in-law is running for Wyoming Senate, and uh, she's not like a blockchain, not Bitcoin person. She's a fucking Bitcoin person, and she gets it, and it's just fucking awesome. It looks like she's going to be running mostly unimposed, and it'll just be great to have a, you know, a true Bitcoiner uh, in she bought her first Bitcoin supposedly in 2013, and it'll be awesome to have a true Bitcoiner in the U.S. Senate. Yeah, shout out to to Will Call for for helping. Her name is Cynthia Loomis, um, again U.S. Representative for Wyoming, and yeah, there's a CoinDesk interview she did with Benjamin Powers that we're going to link to, and in it she sort of shits on stable coins and uh, central bank currencies lit. and says says they don't make any sense so fifth pillar or fifth column i forget which one it is i get yelled at every time as opposed Uh, there's someone you know there's someone running for like new york house of representatives that i saw come up on my twitter feed that people have been promoting and it's like he's like blockchain everything we're gonna have blockchain voting decentralized internet all this shit like that shit isn't bullish this shit is bullish this is what we want to see that shit just confuses people um that's a positive note. And these these are pretty positive. Yeah, but just not as po- I don't know the Will Cole. Like I just I love that. I love that she's running for Senate. Yeah. Well, speaking of Wyoming, we don't have this on the list, and we mentioned James O'Byrne earlier with uh, Sumo UTXO, but he just took a job at Avanti, the Avanti Bank in Wyoming. Uh, Caitlin Long, uh, Brian Bishop are on that team. It looks like James is going to be joining them. So it'll be very interesting to see what they produce keep uh 
subscribe to this podcast so that the Will Cole episode gets downloaded immediately for you because we actually talk about Avanti specifically and uh, the type of, of bank that it is and, and why it's very beneficial for Bitcoiners. I was actually torn on Avanti when it was first announced. I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. Uh, Will started to convince me otherwise. Um, maybe it is a big deal. And now our boy James is going to work there. I mean, that's that obviously... Uh, puts it in a more positive light for me. So it should be interesting to see what they have that they have brewing for us over there. Yes. Um, it is, uh, it'll be dumb, dumb. It'll be dope to see what they produce. So congrats <laughs> to James for taking that job. I was, I was talking to him last night. He's excited. Um, excited to see what they produce. Wyoming becoming a hot spot, becoming a big hot spot. Um, looking more appeasing by the day too, as this world, slips into to madness marty just likes wyoming because kanye's building a citadel out there right i hey kanye you build your citadel out there if you have any natural gas resources oil resources and you want to you want to turn any of those wasted resources into bitcoin we can help you out at great american mining that was my gam shill of the episode disclosure disclosure i work for them um all right positive news grants going out i didn't i didn't see this this Gleb one until you put the list, but Gleb Nalmenko, he's been on this podcast before. He is, um, he's going to be discussed later in this episode for another topic, but, uh, BitMEX gave him a hundred thousand dollar one year grant, um, to focus on developing Bitcoin core. Gleb does incredible work specifically or particularly bingo word, uh, Make sure you make sure you're putting your dots in your bingo board here. Uh, Gleb does a lot of great work at the P2P level of Bitcoin Core and is an incredible uh, mind in the space and has has really helped push uh, the P2P network further. Again, I, I believe I'm like 98 percent confident he had some he had a hand in in the Erebus attack stuff and identifying it and pointing out uh ways that it could be fixed and on top of that he uh is also part of the team that uh wrote the early proposal and early would help reduce the amount of bandwidth needed to run bitcoin significantly and gleb um, was formerly with chain code uh and so we we've met him in new york just great dude smart dude we're lucky to have him and it's good to see bitmex stepping up and funding his 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 work and his research Yes. Thank you for doing what you do, Gleb. We're extremely appreciative. Uh, another grant, Square Crypto gave out their sixth grant. It goes to I'm gonna I'm gonna they they tell us how to pronounce it in the tweet, and I, I think they're fucking with us. So it's a Talia, Talia. Well, that's the Talia? name of the project, right? Goes to Talia. Yes, based in Spain and developed by uh, Sergi. Sergio Delgado, Sergi Delgado. Excuse me, um, building the Eye of Satoshi. Um, lightning watch so Talia is building a FOSS lightning watchtower which actually is good to be seeing considering what we're going to discuss in a little bit here um, let's just explain what a watchtower is uh, they've been talking about it forever but we don't really have an easy implementation yet uh, for users and the idea is with lightning if you're running a lightning node you want to be online as much as possible just in case um your channel partner, the person you have payment channels with, tries to broadcast an old state to take your money. Uh, a watchtower basically allows you to rely on the watchtower to keep an eye. And if if you're offline and the watchtower notices that that an old state has been broadcast, they will broadcast a penalty transaction. And just the idea that we have watchtowers out there should reduce the likelihood of someone intentionally broadcasting a bad state because the penalty transaction takes their money and they don't want that to happen. Yeah, exactly. Incentives, loose incentives herd that disinc herd immunity, loose incentives that disincentivize people from acting maliciously on the lightning network, particularly. Um, so this is great to see square crypto gave out that grant. Very interested to see what Sergey and team puts out there. Um, staying on watchtowers and staying on Gleb uh, Gleb in conjunction with Antoine. Uh, I, Antoine's last name is escapingly. Let me put up the 
Antoine Riard. Um, they they released a blog this week, uh, time dilation attacks on the Lightning Network. So they uh, discovered a, an attack on the peer-to-peer layer against Lightning Network to steal funds from payment channels. Um, the way I understand it, in short, I'm like getting all, all these vulnerabilities mixed up in my head right now. We've talked about so many. Um, so their takeaways are many Lightning users, especially those with Lightning or Bitcoin light clients, uh, are currently vulnerable to Eclipse attacks. Those Lightning users which run Bitcoin core full nodes are most robust to Eclipse attacks, but the attacks are still possible. As a recent research shows, Eclipse attacks enable stealing funds via time dilation. Time dilation attacks can't be mitigated with just observing slow block arrivals, so there's no simple solution to uh, the Eclipse attack stealing funds. Uh, thus, time dilation is a practical way to steal funds from eclipsed users. Neither it requires hash rate nor targeted at merchants only. Lake client users are a good target because they are easy to attack. Full node users are a good target because they are often used by major hubs. And stealing their aggregate liquidity might justify the high attack cost. Um, strong anti-eclipse measures is the key solution. So watchtowers are cool So um, in this instance. Just to try and summarize here. The, the idea is basically you Eclipse attack the lightning node in question and the target one. And Eclipse attack is the idea is you're surrounding, you're surrounding the node with bad information to, to make it so that they're not getting the most recent block data. So then you can yeah, broadcast so you, a bad state and they can't broadcast the penalty transaction in time. Is that the idea? I believe so, yes, the way I understand it. Um, and so a couple things here. Eclipse attack again. It attempts to get you connected to peers, malicious peers that will feed you this bad data. So you have to be connected to these peers. It has been pointed out in the past by Sergey Delgado, who is the guy who just got the Square Crypto <laughs> um, grant, and it's all blending together, that Eclipse is as far as an attack can get without physical access to the node. Um, they're considered to be very difficult, though. So it is certainly possible but again it's it's difficult uh we'll see maybe they become more common as as bitcoin becomes more valuable um so if you're using a light client specifically uh, you're probably more vulnerable to this attack so if you're running lightning lightning nodes and using lightning um probably want to be running a full node but the people running the people running a light client probably don't have much on their lightning i would hope not yeah um, well, anyway, lightning is very much still, still new territory, you know. So you need to be uh, more more wary when using it, and 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 try not to be too reckless. Okay, so this is the way they attack. They surround the the eclipse, attack the node, and then they start feeding the node blocks at a slower rate until the victim is n blocks behind the actual tip where N is defined by this particular configuration. Um, in the case of Bitcoin Core, the time dilation speed is limited by 20 minutes delay per block due to implemented stale tip detection. For Neutrino, an attacker can simply stop feeding blocks to the victim. That's why it would take longer to attack Bitcoin Core in this description, because Core has that um, limited 20-minute delay per block. Can't go much, much further than that. Um, they say at the end... Their conclusions are that they believe that Lightning is really cool and something that is important for Bitcoin and to get more attention on these attacks is important right now to sort of shore up the security model before it gets mass adoption. Um, so again, thank you, Gleb and Antoine, for doing this work. And it seems like Sergey and the I Satoshi will help mitigate this attack. So it's cool to see that they got funded and um, people are highlighting these problems and, and working to fix them. The idea behind Watchtower is helping here, I guess, is you would have to Eclipse attack both the Watchtower and the target node, and you don't necessarily know where the Watchtower is as well. And if there's just Watchtowers in general, then we do get that kind of herd immunity that we talked about earlier, I think, right? I believe so, yeah. I believe your counterpart in a Lightning Channel doesn't know if you're using a Watchtower no, they Even don't. That's why you have herd immunity. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to eclipse attack both. And you did, and to do that, you'd have to know 
like Matt said, who the Watchtower is, which would be impossible if not very hard to find out. But no one's really the... using Watchtowers right now. So exactly. Get so, them out. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Square Crypto and Sergi, uh, for working on that because it is it is needed. Ooh, excuse me. Um, yeah, shout out to everybody working on it. Gleb, Antoine, Sergi. Thank you guys for doing what you do. You're making this stuff better. Um, Chain analysis web uh, webinar archive dump. How'd you get this, bro? So there's been this there's this Telegram channel that I've been watching uh, for a while now that I've been using also to help me with this list. Whoever runs it does like a really good job with curation over there, um, and they got their hands on two pieces of. So that's no bullshit. Bitcoin is the Telegram channel. Uh, if you just search that in Telegram, and they they also have a a domain no bullshit bitcoin dot com uh, that just directs you to it through the web browser. But they got two things uh, that they released this this weekend and yesterday. I think the Europol part, port, uh, report was so. One is a full chain analysis webinar archive dump uh, that is all the video webinars that chain analysis has done, which is one of the most uh, most used surveillance companies in the space. So those are very interesting to watch. I've watched some of them. They're, they're pretty good uh, in terms of knowing your enemy. One interesting tidbit from the most recent chain analysis webinar is that they say themselves that CoinJoin isn't inherently illegal, which I thought is you know a pretty important thing for, for people to hear on the pod because we've been saying this this whole time and, and they're a surveillance company uh, who has kind of been insinuating that this should be considered illegal activity, but even they say it is not inherently illegal. So that's really big. And then the other thing they released is this unconfirmed Europol Wasabi wallet report, um, which is, is very interesting uh, because Europol uh, it actually used Wasabi wallet and like worked their way through how the coin joints work, which is fucking craziness. Yeah, man. I mean, sh- I go out there with the assumption that these agencies are attempting to understand Bitcoin and, and, and attack it as well. And some people have said that they don't think the Europol report is legitimate, uh, but it looks legit to me. I like I don't they they like don't get complacent. The Europol report says that Wasabi Wallet uh, they can't unwind the transactions. Um, we, we have learned in the past that specifically the unmixed change, if you handle that poorly um, and if you don't remix, uh, it, it can be linked back to you and can be unwound. Uh, so just be very careful there. Don't get a false sense of security, but it does seem legit. Yeah, um, I haven't dove into that report yet. It's on my list of things to do. Beware, freaks. Shout out to this no bullshit Bitcoin I just joined on Telegram. Um, it's, a uh, it's receive only. You can't interact with it. Uh, it's just putting out dope information. All the links I'm seeing so far are, are legit. That Bloomberg June 2020 report is pretty bullish too. And we don't have that on the list, right? We don't. I didn't go through the whole thing, but it seems like Bloomberg's just doing some pretty intense, uh, analysis of Bitcoin market structure, which is interesting to see the Bitcoin or Bloomberg LP specifically which is catered towards high net worth individual and institutional investors. So it was a pretty thorough uh, report and analysis of, of Bitcoin's market structure, which was really interesting to see. I'm, that works for me. I'm glad they're bullish. Right. They are. They, I think the, uh, the line that they had, Bitcoin 10,000 is gaining support. Um, and their first bullet point is something needs to go really wrong for Bitcoin not to appreciate. <laughs> I mean, the stock market's been pumping, right? So, yeah, that doesn't yeah. really make that much sense. The Bitcoin price should pump too. Why not? Yeah, there's some fuckery with the price this week. Pumped over 10k and back to like nine five. A lot of people, a lot of people are pointing at Bitmax saying, "What the fuck's going on over there?" And it's just smart money fucking with the leverage traders and and making money off of it pump it high and then dump it lower get hit on both sides don't use leverage freaks dm dm bitcoin tina if you're thinking about using leverage he'll 
He'll talk you off the ledge. Uh, staying on exchanges, exchanges hold about three million. Or excuse me. Um, yeah, three million plus Bitcoin are held on exchanges with Coinbase. Three point. 3.43, so it's like th- almost 3.5 million. Oh, I thought they said 3.08. Is that good? Oh, yes, yeah, it was 3.343 earlier this year. So that's actually incredible to see. It's 3.08 now, so about one-seventh, a little bit more than one-seventh of all the Bitcoin that will ever exist are on exchanges. Look how much Coinbase, Coinbase has. Ha- Coinbase has 984,300 Bitcoin on it, at least right now, and they're one of the shittiest exchanges out there is that is Zappo included in that? Uh, it must it must include Zappo plus Coinbase because Zappo's not yeah. listed separately. Uh, yeah. If you because Coinbase bought Zappo right earlier this year or last year, late last year. Uh, yes. If you have if, if especially with the current macro climate and everything that's going on in the world, like you are especially you know idiotic to have your funds on exchanges right now like you should not your keys not your coins in general but like you got to get you got to figure it out guys you got to you got to get your keys off these exchanges you can't it's just a it's a ticking time bomb i cannot believe how much bitcoin coinbase has right now it's disgusting and coinbase can't even handle they apparently they have something like a if the price moves five hundred dollars in a short amount of time they shut everything down like this is this happened earlier this week they they focus so much on shit coins they can't even get their exchange, uh, their market engine, their matching engine, and their 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 Bitcoin exchange actually usable, especially when there's high volatility. But we don't know if that's that, intentional or not, right? Like someone insinuated that that was intentional on Twitter, right? I think so. Yeah. But well, Rusty Russell came out. I think Rusty Russell's piece oh earlier God. this week sort of stoked those uh, those assumptions. So Rusty came out of the piece basically saying exchanges are a huge attack on Bitcoin because they really don't care about Bitcoin. They just care about making fees from trading, specifically shit coins. It makes a good case. Yeah, I mean, he put into writing what a lot of us have been saying for a while, right? Is that they yeah. they say, I like Bitcoin, and then buy my shit coin, and they come in and they, they sell yeah, you fucking, a bunch of shit. Coinbase, so did like, Added like Oh My's Go a couple weeks ago. Isn't that like a dead zombie project? Yeah. What the fuck is that? I mean, nothing. You know, they just want to, they just want to help their VC backers dump on retail. <sighs> right. The A A sixteen Z portfolio consolidation company Coinbase. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fuck Coinbase. They had, like ah. Uh, Oh, now we're getting now we're getting, now you're getting Uncle Marty all riled up. He's a cider and a half deep, and just thinking about how much they fucked up their chances to actually do good. So many like, and that's one thing Rusty said in his piece too. Is like you'll send somebody to Coinbase or an exchange like it to buy Bitcoin. And they'll come back to you with oh my's go like oh I bought this one. It was like fifty cents. It's like what the fuck. But just to steel man ourselves a little bit, like we talk about all the time how. They could be in such a better position right now. They really fucked themselves. But then you look at this Bitcoin balances on exchanges and they're more than double the next, which is Wobi. And then Wobi is more than Binance. They're over triple the amount of Bitcoin that's held on Binance is held on Coinbase. Right. So they still are even with all their missteps, they're still doing pretty well for themselves. And I almost think to myself, you know, maybe we're looking at this wrong. Maybe the best thing they could have ever done for Bitcoin was they just fucked their business so much that they only have 980,000 Bitcoin instead of having 3 million Bitcoin or something. Like if, if, they, if they had not fucked their business, who knows how much Bitcoin they would have at this point and, and how much control they could try and, and wield there and, and what a ticking time bomb it could be. Yeah, it's, uh, thank God for their incompetence. (laughs) Fuck you, Brian Armstrong. You weasel. Naked mole rat. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't like to personally attack anyone. You called him a naked mole rat while he's not wearing (laughs) a shirt. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going full DeRose today, no shirt. 
hopped off the beach to come do this. Uh, Canadian exchanges, man. Rough run for them. Coin Square, Canadian exchange, as private users' data was stolen uh, as an employee went rogue. So an ex-employee went rogue and has been selling uh, Coin Square user data on black markets. Some people have been getting... Coin, Coin Square users have been getting SIM swapped right and left. This story made it to Vice. Vice heard about this. 5,000 email addresses, names, phone numbers, some mailing addresses, and uh, also their first six months of activity, uh, which is was there to show like if they were a whale or not, if they were a big user. Um, and this was a marketing person stole this data. And this just brings us back to BlockFi, which we talked about either last week or the week before. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. Like if these companies are custodians of your private data. They need to treat it with the respect that it deserves. They need to treat it, at, you know, like they treat the Bitcoin that they secure. Uh, this data is super intimate. Uh, it's going it, to it puts their users at risk of theft and extortion. And it shouldn't be just any old employee with access to it. Uh, that was one of the things that was really uh, highlighted in the in the BlockFi thing that a lot of people I think missed. Right? It's it wasn't only that BlockFi's employee was using two factor through SMS, which is absolutely ridiculous. The question comes down to why did that employee have access to this intimate information to begin with? Like respect your users, man. And if you don't, it, it, it's it's not just a moral thing. Like this is it's good for your business. You need to secure this information. Otherwise, no one's going to trust you with securing their private information. Yeah, it's fucked up. You really, as if you're operating a KYC AML Bitcoin service provider, whether it be an exchange, a lending provider, you have to alienate these processes and only give a few, very few trusted people uh, access to this information. And keep as Maybe. little information as possible and secure that fucking information. Yeah, it's. I mean, the res- this is amateur. Hour. The stakes, amateur. Hour, the stakes are too high. Coin Square, fu- fucked up, fucked up. Yeah, a rogue employee just selling all this shit on the black market. Fuck that, dude. Like, how evil do you have to be to do that? How much of a loser do you have to be? A bunch of losers, man. Uh, should we take a break and do some shout outs? We got a few. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got to answer a question. Matt Marty, love the content, love the whiskey, consumption on the pod. Get with it, Marty. Hey, the tables have turned today, freak. Uh, I have a question for you guys. I have some sat stashed offline in cold storage on a paper wallet that was never printed, only saved on a password-protected memory stick via PDF. Uh, the paper wallet keys were generated offline on the computer is never and will never be connected to the Internet with Bitcoin technology constantly evolving and improving. What would you suggest as more secure method to stash these sats long term? Greatly appreciated the work you guys are doing. Our friend Mr. Shaw two fifty six from the internet. Uh, my advice would be if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you plan on holding long term and you're confident in this, in uh, the key generation that you did when you did it and the security of your memory stick, and you don't plan on moving those Bitcoin for quite a while, Bitcoin software, even though the software is improving very uh all the time uh the important thing to remember is that it's always backwards compatible so uh just pretend like you're the man in the coma and bitcoin should work for you when you want to move those coins i don't uh, really plan on- i don't really like that model uh marty is right uh one of the most important things when you're securing your bitcoin is that you are comfortable with your method uh but paper wallets have a lot of foot gun potential. There's a lot of areas where you can fuck yourself. Um, storing them on a USB drive that could have a high failure rate uh, is also an issue. You don't know if that USB drive is going to die on you. Um, so, I mean, and if, if you haven't gotten rid of the computer, the computer itself can be a attack vector if, if someone gets physical access to it. So, I, I mean, I think for most users cold card would be a superior option. If you're securing a decent amount of coin, um, it's well worth whatever a cold card costs. Like how much does a cold card cost now? 70 bucks or I something? I haven't, I haven't checked the prices. 
anyway, it's well. I think it's well worth it. You know, consider it, and you don't have to. You know, put all your Bitcoin on in the beginning. Uh, and yeah, in, diverse. In general, what a good a good rule of thumb is to use multiple methods. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you do fuck something up, if you do if you do get compromised, at least you don't lose everything at once. Agreed. Agreed. But again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Maybe you can have multiple backups for this if you want to. Uh, again, yeah, whatever you're comfortable with. Another good option is uh, if you run Tails, they have Electrum built in. Tails is an amnesiac uh, Linux distro where you, you run it from a USB drive. Um, if people want paper wallets, uh, I tend, it's not a traditional paper wallet, but I think it's the best method. Uh, where you basically just you generate the keys in the Tails instance, and then you write down the seed from Electrum. Um, obviously, it's better if you use your own node with Electrum, but if you don't, uh, at least Tails defaults to Tor. So when you do connect to those other Electrum nodes, it'll, it'll go through Tor, so they won't know your IP address. Um, and, it, if you, and just the generation process, you could actually do that all offline. And then you're only doxing your addresses if you, if if you specifically go to look them up using Electrum. Uh, if you're just generating, it doesn't actually send any information to the servers. Bang bang, that is our advice, Mister Shaw Two Fifty Six. Do your own research. T- do your own research. Take it as you will. Don't trust us. Uh, next shout out. All the Aussie freaks are excited to hear you boys. That's us, Matt. Uh, are going to be doing the t- li- a live TFTC from Bitblock Boom, and even more that it's going to be streamed to help that conversation flow and ease any nervousness after so long apart. There's a trusted third party who will be providing you boys with some liquid love, peace, and love. Shout out to our Aussie freaks. Thank you guys for listening. Does that mean Australia or Austin? Australia. Oh, I'm pretty sure. We love it. We love it. Thank you. Thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Uh, we. Love all you freaks. That's why we do it. Um, Marty still has shout to send out to, me the Mictors. All right, um, let's, we'll meet up and drink it in person. Damn right. Uh, I miss you, bro. I miss you too. Uh, last one. Proposed Citadel code. Sure, there will be revisions. Number one, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Number two, good don't rule. take people's stuff. Another good rule. Number three, stay humble. Number four, stack sats. And the golden rule is for Shifty Pete. I have no idea who Shifty Pete is. Maybe it's um, his boy. Maybe it's your boy. Maybe you got a boy named Shifty Pete out there. Uh, is there a golden rule for Shifty Pete, or is just Shifty Pete the golden rule? I think the first rule was for Shifty Pete, which is don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole, Shifty Pete. Be a little bit less shifty. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, Shifty Pete. That's a that's a weird nickname. Uh, we'll see that has no attribution. Neither did the Aussie shout out. Those are the shout outs of the week. Shout out to you freaks. We do this because of you. Um, anybody else who wants to buy a shout out to be read on air can do so at tftc.io slash contribute. That is not the end of the episode though. We've got a few more topics to talk about and I'm getting the wrap it up sign here. So we got to do them quickly. Um, important. One signal adds photo blur feature. It's good for privacy. Uh, yeah, you, you can just blur faces in the app uh, with all the protesting going on. Uh, you don't want to be doxing people's faces in the photos you share. Uh, and signal also already had the built-in feature that it automatically removes all EXIF data, which is the data that's attached to every picture when you take it that says like which phone or camera you took it with and sometimes includes location data and stuff. So it's good to see Signal add this this feature directly in. So if if you want, even if you're going to post to social media, uh, you can actually just send it through Signal first and handle that all on mobile, and then you can upload it if you so please. Yes. And this is actually a pre- pretty big one I just skipped over. Tor Browser version 9.5 adds human readable addresses. Um, so, that seems like a pretty big UX improvement. Yeah, so Onion addresses, uh, the Tor native addresses historically have been the exact opposite of human readable. Uh, They're just like long alphanumeric strings. Uh, So this is a pilot project that they're doing in partnership 
with uh, two organizations that use Secure Drop, uh, which is Aaron Schwartz, uh, before he passed away, his project. Um, which Rest are, in peace. Damn right. And uh, which, which, allows, which allows sources to give journalists uh, data without easily compromising their identity by using Tor. Uh, so this helps them confirm it. Um, also, they have a feature where if you go to a plain, uh, a, a regular website through Tor browser and there's an Onion service that exists, a native address on Onion, which is, is what you want to do because then it doesn't go through an exit node. And, and if an exit node is, is compromised, uh, which a lot of them are believed to be, that is another attack vector. So it's nice. It's better to go to the specific Onion address and it will tell you. It'll tell you up there. Um, in terms of trade-offs, one thing that people have been talking about is it adds some fungibility concerns. Uh, I use fungibility as a Bitcoiner to Tor because people worry that there'll be like two classes of Tor. There'll be like the approved corporate-ish Tor where you, you have human readable addresses and a broadcast and then you'll have the the non which it'll be just like as tour is currently right now so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out needless to say there's been so much shit going on this week uh, i haven't been able to properly delve into it but that's a, i think a pretty solid overview there if you're using tour consider this update and consider these these addresses uh last thing our buddy our boy matt here our buddy i'm sorry for calling you buddy our boy Matt here was on the Stefan Lavera podcast on behalf of our good friend 6102 Bitcoin to answer questions about uh, Bitcoin privacy and other subjects. What was that experience like, Matt? We were supposed to surprise them. We were supposed to tell them that it was 6102's uh, first podcast experience. In the in the in both the description and the show notes and stuff, we don't mention me at all. In the beginning, Stefan pretends that he's interviewing uh, 6102. But yeah, I, I love 6102. I love all the work he's done. And it was an honor that he asked me to speak his words on Stefan's podcast. And at the end, we discussed his words and, and, and how we felt about them and, and, and those topics in general. And I just, you know, 6102 is just, he's an admirable Bitcoiner. Like, I think he's the type of Bitcoiner that people that are want to focus on education like we are uh, should should seek to be like, you know, to try and emulate that. Uh, because it's amazing that, you know, he's able to do that while protecting his privacy. And I just, it's super commendable. So, uh, definitely check out that show, uh, and check out, we've shielded a million times, but 6102 bitcoin.com and bitcoin dash only.com, uh, his two main projects and bitcoin dash intro.com. Just great dude. Love his projects. So that was a fun one to record. We, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh yeah, he turned into uh into Guy Swan there, just reading. I I said to him, I was like, maybe Guy is better better suited for I it was the most nervous I've ever been in at least in a while since like our early days uh doing a podcast because both I respect him a lot, so I didn't want to uh let him down and also he gave me like a wall of text that I had to read. And I tried to be as passionate about it as possible while I was doing it. So, yeah. Um, thank you for doing that, Matt. Shout out to you, sixty one hundred two, for all that you do. Really appreciate your work. Keep crushing. And Stefan, would be remiss of us not to shout you out as well. Keep crushing what you're doing at SLP. Uh, last topic list before we get to our comments on what's going on around. United States right now. Uh, our boy at point six one five on Twitter came up with a, a few tales from the crypt bingo uh, boards, and it has me feeling like we repeat ourselves a lot, Matt. There's a lot of nuance here. We got to unpack it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that bingo board. It's great. It's fantastic. Did you see, I love all the did love. You see, he released the second round. Rodolfo made it. Apparently, we talk about Rodolfo a lot. Rodolfo made uh, what? The second bingo board. Oh, There's oh, another yeah. bingo board we, made. Well, we did mention him a couple times in this podcast already. Yeah. So if you had him on your board, we'll we'll do a. You might have got TFTC bingo. We'll do a live stream one of these days, and we'll do uh, TFTC bingo with it. I intentionally yeah, we'll did not look at the bingo board again before we started today, just in case you're playing bingo at home, 
I wasn't going to, because I knew if I read it, I was just going to start, I was just going to start fucking with you and just say all the things in a row. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. Yeah. Um, shout out to point six or no point six one five on Twitter, uh, for putting, for putting that together. It's, it's Thanks, flattering Frank. to see, uh, that sh- that type of shit. Uh, I got to wrap up here. I'm getting the wrap up call from downstairs, but we have to touch on what's going on in the United States. Chaos has broken out in the aftermath of George F- Floyd's murder at the hand of a cop in Minneapolis. Uh, riots have broken out ac- across the country. Protests have broken out. A lot of anger towards police officers. A lot of discussion about systemic racism. Uh, I'll keep it short and brief. What I think uh Number one, racism is abhorrent. Number two, uh, protesting is extremely good. Peaceful protesting is extremely good and should be encouraged. Number three, riots that destroy private property of your fellow citizens is despicable, and you're really not helping yourself, and you're actually hurting the people who are oppressed with you. Uh, And the fourth point is police brutality and murder uh, funded by the state is is not good at all, and Bitcoin helps fix that by helping defund the state and keeping the security forces in check. Hopefully, we can transition to a world where uh, private security forces rule the day, and they have a higher incentive to actually um, care for the citizens that are paying for their services. Uh, and to top of that, uh, I do think the media, the political class, the corporate class are using the situation to take advantage of a lot of people and are manipulating people. That's as far as I'll go. I'll try and keep this short because Marty needs to go. Um, I guess we'll talk about it more at length next week because uh, it is very important. And uh, it is something that unfortunately is like the worst kind of told you so. Like I've expected this kind of uh, civil unrest for a while. Um, I did talk about it more at length with uh, Alex Gladstein or boy Gladstein, um, on the Swan live signal. So if you want to go check that out, uh, you might, that might be worth it. Um, but just, I, I want to just highlight a couple things here real quick. Uh, first of all, that was fucking murder that they did to George Floyd. It's good to see that they finally arrested the other three officers that were involved. Um, took them fucking long enough. Like you'd think they'd at least do the classic police thing where they arrest them. And then three months later, uh, don't actually charge them with anything, you know, or don't actually convict. Uh, they didn't even do that until I, I believe yesterday. Uh, if you, if you watch the video, it's like that the dude's waiting for him to die. It's very super fucked up. Fucked up. Um, and I just, a couple of things is this feels global to me. We have seen protests around the world, anti-government protests around the world. It is just now coming to America. Uh, This is, you know, years, decades of inequality in the making. Uh, You know, inequality is inherent in any system, but our system, our global system of governance, the way everything interacts, uh, purely benefits um, the the rich and those in power and and makes inequality worse. And, and, And... and people have had enough. And it's, it's, I just, it's really good to see, you know, I agree with you that, that we don't want to see looting. We don't want to see violence against uh, innocent Americans. Uh, but, you know, I, it, it is bullish to see Americans wake up and actually go out and protest and let their voices be heard, especially after three months of, you know, forced lockdown and all, you know, it, it, that aspect, um, you know, that that is definitely a major positive aspect to all of this. Yeah, it's it's almost too perfect though, the transition from COVID to this. It's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, like again, it's again. There's nuance here. Bingo board. Gotta check unpack mark. it. Uh, gotta unpack it. Well, we can't because Marty's got to. There are. That's why, like, you're being some. A lot of people are being manipulated. There are people like Antifa. Antifa exists. They are real. They are organized. They are using this to leverage the the unrest and the the anger right now to push their political agenda. And their political agenda is to bring socialism and communism to the United States. So be aware of this. They are not well intentioned. 
they are stoking violence in these cities. So much, a lot of the rioting has broke out because people like in groups like Antifa have started it. But uh, if you want, video- if you want to break up peaceful protests, and if you want to get the people of your country to be against peaceful protests, the easiest way is to have provocateurs make them violent. It's super easy to do. You know, we we see the 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 thing here is is the the worst thing for authoritarians. The worst thing for authoritarians is to have a united people protest against them and to resist. And and what I'm worried about here and I I just to the freaks like remember like it's it's all right to be angry. Like people should be angry. Like a lot of people lost their jobs. They watched the bailouts and the stimulus uh, directly help the upper classes while the working people were losing their livelihoods and and they were neglected and they were pushed too far and they ang- people are angry and people should be angry but like there there are people at work trying to divide us and to make us you know go against each other we see people friends and family fortunately i'm not on all these other social media platforms where i'm surrounded by political views and friends and family but i've heard all these things about how they're dividing us right people are getting angry at each other when each other isn't the problem. Each other is, you know, we're all getting taken advantage of. And it's, it's exactly. stay focused that's wh- here. That's why I think, and I know, I probably get, may get canceled for saying this, but I think the focus on race is, is intentional and is a tactic to divide the populace right now. Um, I, I agree. Again, and that's why I think it's important to realize this is global. Uh, and, 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 and we have to be vigilant because there's going to be some major domestic surveillance authoritarianism that comes comes next here, and uh, we already see them flexing it. We already see them; they're flying DEA planes to track people's locations, and and it's just there's Orwellian. Like you got fucking Cuomo in in at like forty or like fifty first and seventh with billboards up with fake tweets. Like don't do the like the Orwellian dystopian future. Yeah, it's. Two Be first. safe out there. Peacefully, Bitcoin fixes this. Let's end it on this. Bitcoin fixes wait, 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 this. Wait. If you want it, f- two firsts are with these protests. The first thing is this is the first citywide curfew that we've had in New York City ever. And then the second thing is, uh, in New York City, it's been illegal to protest in a mask since the 1800s. This is the first protest where that's not the case. And just keep that in mind. When that's one of the reasons why back. Back in the beginning of this whole COVID thing, they didn't want people to wear masks because it empowers people and empowers the individual. All right. I got one more thing to say there. So, like, COVID, was that a huge psyop? Like, nobody gives a fuck so. anymore. I, I, I mean, it was... It was a real virus that... It was a real virus. It was like took advantage of to, to increase yeah, their power. As, as an overreaction. Is as is tradition. An overreaction. All right. We're, we're going to end it on this. I'm going to get castrated here. By my wife, who's waiting to go to the beach. Um, Bitcoin fixes this. If you want to fix it, these problems are systemic because the people in power control the money and the means of the flow of that money. Take away the funding for these things. They can print money to go to war. To and guess what? When we go to war and we create all this this military gear for our soldiers, it comes back home and it militarizes our police. Uh, if you can defund this and make sure that the state is holding up their end of the bargain and only gets an amount of money that uh, hopefully, hopefully the state isn't is extremely small in the future and Bitcoin can lead us to that future. That's why we do this podcast. That's why I do the newsletter. That's why we do what we do. Bitcoin is a tool. Bitcoin doesn't fix this, but we can fix this using Bitcoin. No, Bitcoin fixes, Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes this. Peace and love freaks. Stay humble stack. Stay humble stack.